Good evening. Welcome to worship. Is uh, tonight we are in our last real uh, Sunday, or I guess it's not Sunday, but weekend in, in Lent. Is uh, next week we begin Holy Week uh, with, with Palm Sunday and, and the celebration of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But uh, then that quick turn uh, to here and uh, turn our focus to the to the passion, death, and ultimately the resurrection of, of Jesus Christ. So uh, just look ahead at, at the schedule for the next week as we spend extra time in worship, as we spend time uh, focusing on our, our Savior's reason for coming uh, for you and for me and for the salvation of the entire world. Tonight in the gospel, we hear um, kind of a, a pretty bold move by two of the disciples, James and John, and, and what they ask Jesus. And while they may not be exactly right in their questioning, um, they give an example for us as to be so bold as to how to speak to Jesus and why um, it's not a bad thing, that, and it's a good thing, actually, that we're able to go to Jesus with such uh, confidence. So we'll hear more about that as well. Uh, with everything coming up, uh, with Holy Week and Easter, there's still time to sign up for the Easter breakfast to either attend or to volunteer. Uh, so please check that out. Like I said, just make sure to check out all the times, especially for worship during Holy Week. And with that, we'll begin our worship this evening with our opening hymn.
please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death, of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, by your great goodness, mercifully look upon your people, that we may be governed and preserved evermore in body and soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Return to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and abounding in steadfast love. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was, uh, what was to happen to, to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us the sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. And Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left hand is not mine to grant, but it is for those to whom, for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them and, to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the Gospel of the Lord. 
You may be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we've heard Jesus say that we're supposed to have faith like a child, childlike faith. And, and I, I think we all kind of have a pretty good idea of what that means. It means we are to just trust with our whole heart, just like a child does with their parent. You know, any parent who loves their child, they're going to do anything for them. And, you know, and especially little, little kids, 
they just know, right? They know automatically that mom and dad will do everything for them. They provide food for them. They, they get them dressed. I mean, they do absolutely everything, never having to ask, and they just take care of them. And that's what we're supposed to do, right? That's what we're supposed to do to survive with God. Just trust him that he provides everything for us, even those things we don't ask for. And and he loves us in a way that we cannot even begin to comprehend. Now, to have childlike faith, though, does not mean you're supposed to act like a spoiled child. There's a big difference, right? You know how a spoiled child acts. You know, I want this and I want that, and and do it now and give me because I want it. I deserve this. We want God to do stuff for us, and no, no matter what you say, you have to say yes, right? Like we, we treat him almost like a, a genie sometimes. And so when you see James and John asking this question, it doesn't seem, at least right off the bat, that they have a childlike faith, simply trusting that Jesus is going to provide and Jesus is going to take care. But look at what they, look how they ask. Give us whatever we want. Okay. You know, it's, it's easy to be critical of them, right? I mean, right off the bat, it, it, it's easy to be like, these guys, who are they kidding? I mean, we even see at the end of the gospel reading, how do the other ten disciples react? They're indignant. Who do these guys think they are? But we should acknowledge that their request came from a place of a childlike, and it is kind of childish, though, faith. Because they wouldn't have asked this question if they truly didn't believe, if they truly didn't understand who Jesus is and and was, that they believed that he had the power. They believed that Jesus was interested in helping them and and supporting them. And for his part, Jesus' response actually kind of affirms that their question wasn't all wrong. That rather than scolding them and saying, you're acting like a bunch of spoiled kids, give me whatever you want, he invites them into further conversation. What do you want me to do for you then? So this leads to the second part of their request. Grant us, one of us to sit at your right hand and one of us at your left in glory. And what they were doing is they were jockeying for positions of power and honor. And that's what people do in this world, right? We like power. We like authority. We like to be in charge. It's our way out of the highway. I'm the leader. I get to do whatever I want. And even if you can't be the leader, you want to be the guy next to the leader, the guy who sits on his right hand or his left hand, because then, then at least you have the ear of the leader, and you can maybe wield your influence kind of, kind of indirectly. And at the very least, if you're at the right of the left hand, you know that he's going to help you. That if you're one of the closest advisors, that you're one of the inner circle, you're in a good spot. And especially in the ancient Middle East, this was very common. Those in the favor of the king would sit on his right or on his left, and they could ask for anything. Because he trusted those people as advisors. So, once again, it seems childish, what they're asking. And maybe they're not exactly asking in the right way. But what they are doing is they acknowledge the kingship of Jesus. And so he obliges. Now, they clearly didn't realize, though, that they're dealing with a different type of king. Because then what does Jesus respond? You don't know what you're asking. Because despite the fact that he had just predicted his passion and resurrection for a third time, they failed to understand how the kingdom of God is different. The kingdom of the world's great and wonderful. If you have the power, if you have the money, if you know the right people, this world can be a pretty great place. But the kingdom of God is different. The kingdom of God comes with humility. The kingdom of God comes with sacrifice. And this was the last chance for these disciples. This was the last chance before their entire world, and quite honestly, the entire world in general, was getting ready to change forever. Because in Mark's gospel, this is taking place right before Palm Sunday. And what Jesus is going to do is he's going to demonstrate 
that every way of his kingdom is completely opposite. That the kingdom of Jesus is an upside-down kingdom compared to the kingdoms of this world. Because Jesus says, if you really want to be great, you have to serve. And what Jesus shows them is he soon will serve. But that serving means he's eventually going to hand over his entire life into the hands of sinners, into the hands of his enemies, and his act of service is actually going to be laying down his life. And while Peter, or sorry, and while James and John didn't really seem to get it, perhaps we can see them still as a bold example. That despite how misguided they were in what they were asking, they were still bold in asking. They were going to ask Jesus for anything. And this is not to say that we can ask or we should ask Jesus for every little thing that serves our whim. Jesus, give us more money. Jesus, give me this. Jesus, give me that. And, you know, if it's his will, fine. But those who believe that Jesus can actually do anything and that he's willing to do anything for what is good, we shouldn't be discouraged. We shouldn't be discouraged for a second. And as a matter of fact, we should be encouraged by that, that we can go to our God for absolutely anything that we can talk to him in very bold and honest ways, even if sometimes it seems a little childish. And yes, there are times where our prayers sound a little bit like the request of James and John. You know, we may not put it so crassly, but we would like, if we're being honest with ourselves, to preface most of our prayers with, Jesus, I want you to do whatever I'm about to ask you to do. And yes, on the surface, that that seems like kind of a childish perspective, right? Like, we shouldn't be speaking to God in that way. But once again, it also comes from a place of confidence that God is able to do absolutely anything. And you and I, instead of maybe being so timid, worried that we're going to say the, the wrong words or we're not going to say it the right way, we should not be afraid to be bold with God. I mean, think about what our God actually wants from us. He invites us to be bold with him. And how amazing is it that we are able to speak directly to God and he wants us to speak to him. When God wants to hear our prayers, it's, it's not like, oh no, but yeah, but not about this though. And not about the real uncomfortable stuff and, and not about the things that are really hurting you. No. He invites us to pour out our hearts. Even if we are angry, even if we are upset, he invites us to speak to him in ways that maybe we wouldn't speak to those who are even closest to in this world. He invites us to speak to him in ways that we definitely wouldn't speak to people who are in positions of power or authority, right? If you meet somebody who's extremely powerful, now you have to be the right way. You have to say the right words. You have to do the right thing as you approach this person of power. But Jesus just wants us to open our mouths and open our hearts. Because as Jesus says, we are called to serve. And our prayers are an act of service for the church and for the world and one another. Think about that. So many times we wonder how we can begin to serve. And especially once we get to certain points in our lives. I can't tell you how many people I've spoken to, and maybe you have as well, where they begin to say, I don't even know why God is keeping me around anymore. What can I do? What can I possibly do anymore? I I used to do this and I used to do that, but, but I can't do anything anymore. And at that moment, you can do the greatest thing. You can pray. You can be bold with God. You can say anything to him. And Jesus doesn't scold us. Even if our prayers may seem selfish, he actually invites us to be bold and also talks about the necessity to serve. And it should draw us into a deeper understanding of who he is. Because God is after much more than meeting the the particular wishes of, of a few certain individuals, whether they're James or John or you, or me. 
because Jesus has come to restore all of us. Jesus has come to restore all of creation, the renewal of all things, the redemption of the cosmos and everyone in it. And yes, that includes you and me. And he does this through his sacrificial, sacrificial suffering and death. He surrenders completely for us. So then he invites us and he shows us and he demonstrates that we are able to surrender too. And it's not that we lay down our life for everybody else like Jesus did, but just to surrender our hearts, to surrender our sins that we hold on to, to surrender whatever burdens our minds and our bodies and give it to Jesus. To speak to him is an act of service that we can all do. Because through our baptisms, we have been brought into the death and resurrection of Jesus. And that which means we are part of his kingdom. We are his people. We are called to serve. We are servant people who follow our servant Lord. And what he does then is he transforms our conception of honor and position by putting us ahead of himself. But as Jesus puts himself ahead of us, he then shows us how we put others in front of us and how we even sacrifice ourselves. Once again, maybe not our lives, but our time. Giving it over to God, taking time to pray for one another, for things outside of ourselves. That we are invited into this upside-down kingdom that doesn't look like the rest of the world. That we continue to enjoy a relationship with God, which includes coming to him in prayer for absolutely all things. But in doing that, he shows us what it means to be great. So if you really want to be great, if you want to be bold like, like Peter, I keep wanting to talk about Peter, like James and John, pray. Go to God in prayer because you have his ear. You have his ear and you have his heart. Pray for yourself. Pray for everyone. Pray for everything. Sacrifice your own time. Sacrifice your own interest. And speak to the one who sacrificed himself for you and for all creation so that he could be with you eternally. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. I want to invite you to please stand now as we confess our Christian faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together we confess... I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. Hence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, pour out your Holy Spirit and write your word on our hearts that we may know you as the God who forgives our iniquities and remembers our sins no more. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, your Son came not to be served, but to serve. Help us not, Lord, our authority over one another, but humbly serve one another in our homes, communities, and congregations, as Christ has so humbly served us. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, Look with all mercy on all earthly authorities. Guard them from the temptation to wield earthly power improperly. Lead them to serve faithfully according to your good and gracious will. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, as your only begotten Son learned obedience through what he suffered, we pray that you would instruct, bless, and relieve your servants. We pray especially for Ron, Luann, Ali, Brenda, Steve, Danny, and all those we name in our hearts. Sustain them as they walk the way of the cross with your Son, that they may know the fullness of his eternal salvation. 
Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, your Son stands before you as our great High Priest. By your Spirit, prepare our hearts to worthily receive the body and blood of our Savior, who was sacrificed for us on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism you declared us to be your children and gather up, gathered us into your one holy church in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.